are live. And it's close enough to 7 o'clock. Oh, it is now 7 o'clock. So let's go ahead and begin our Bible study tonight. Brother Valencia, would you please stand and open our study in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for all the words you've given us, Lord. Give us the words that we can hide in our hearts, Lord, and we can learn from this. Lord, I just thank you for your word that you give us every day. Thank you for everything you've done in our lives and everything we're going to do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Now, we've retreaded this at least on one occasion. I know that in the last Bible study we covered a lot of the material we'd already covered, but, but there's still going to be a little bit of review in tonight's, at least in the beginning of our Bible study tonight. Let's take it from verse 5. Where Paul says, who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man receive that every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Now, last week this turned into this turned into a teaching about about the outreach effort. You could say whether it's organized, whether it's uh, casual, one-on-one, -on -one, individual, group, whatever the case may be. It turned into a lesson on being part of the greater effort of reaching out to the lost, as he explains here. One man waters, one man plants, another man waters. But it's God that gives the increase. So it's, it's not he that plants that gets any glory. Neither is it he that waters that gets any glory. We simply are willing participants in God's evangelical process to reach the lost. And that's a process, by the way, that we should not despise. We really we should not despise it. We should not look upon it as a burden of inconvenience or as a a grievous taxation to our flesh because each and every single one of us here tonight and everybody watching on the live stream, as many as who have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, we've benefited from that process. We've benefited from that. Somebody, somewhere, planted in our heart and in our mind the Word of God. And yes. somebody, somewhere, watered that, that, that seed that was planted in us and God, in the fullness of time, when we were ready to believe or when we were open to believe or however you want to look at that, when God blessed us with that gift of faith, we believed and God gave increase. Well, who did he give it to? Well, he gave it to himself, for one thing, because where once we were alienated from God, now no longer. We are no longer alienated from him, no longer separated from him. Yeah. No longer isolated from him and unreconciled. But he further, he further gave that increase to the church. When you first believed and, be, believed and became part of this fellowship, or whether it was another fellowship you were a part of at the time, whenever, whenever and wherever that was, it was God that gave that increase. Gave the increase to himself, gave it to the kingdom, gave it to the church to the body of Christ, to the individual local fellowship that, uh, to which we all belong right here in Cheyenne. So it's God that has given the increase. Now, I know we don't see a whole lot of brand new conversions in our church here. I think that the main reason for that is the demographic of the folks that we tend to meet and folks that you tend to meet. It tends to be people that have drifted away from the faith and then come to our church rededicating their lives to Christ yes. And renewing that newness of life that once perhaps they had received and then wandered off from. It happens a lot. It happens a lot, especially in modern society where we are beset with so many temptations and so many distractions to just blunder off into. You know what I mean? It happens. It's very common. Oh, we got someone else coming down. Everybody turn and look. Just kidding. Bless you. Welcome. Come on in. So it's a process that we should not despise. We really shouldn't. It's not something that we should view as something that is uncomfortable or grievous because every single one of us has benefited from that process. We would not be saved today if it were not for someone's outreach effort or even the outreach efforts of many because sometimes it takes that. 
Sometimes it takes that. A pastor that you knew 15 years ago or, or a, a family member who was in the church a long time ago who first impressed upon you. Either way, whether it was just one or two people reaching out to you with the gospel or whether it was the process or the, the efforts of 10 or 15 people over the course of your entire life, you come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so, here he says, Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. And that's where we left off last night, was here, in, or last week, excuse me, was in verse 9. He says that we're laborers together with God. And ministers of the gospel in particular are laborers together with God. And that's what Paul's trying to get, trying to get through to them here. Because you have to remember... They were divided in the church in Corinth. The church in Corinth had many problems that were going on in that congregation. It wasn't just one problem. They had several problems that were going on. Uh, and it's not, like, it's not like Paul addressed them in order of importance or which one was the worst problem. So what was the problems that they had? Well, they were divided. They were cliquish. They were split up one, uh, uh, one from... Um, they were split from one another within their congregation based on who reached them. And that's the first problem that Paul is addressing here in the first three chapters. But they had other problems on top of that as well. They had rampant sexual immorality that was going on uh, between one, two, or more of the church's membership. They, had, they were completely whacked out charismatic as far as their understanding and abuses and misunderstandings and misuses of the spiritual gifts. So they had people that misunderstood what tongues were all about, and so they were misusing that. They misunderstood what prophecy was all about, and so they're misusing that. And this is very, very timely, actually, that we're digging in to this book of the Bible and this part of this book of the Bible right now. It's very timely for a number of different reasons, because we are... And we've been in this we've been in this time period for a while now, so I don't want to make it sound like it's just happened since 2020 or even since 2015 or 16. We've been in this time period for a while. I want to point I want to pinpoint it uh, down to about the late 60s and 70s is sort of where we entered into this time period where you've got a lot of people misunderstanding the word. And it's only gotten worse with certain modern movements that have surfaced in the church world at large. And we've talked about some of them lately, like the NAR, the, uh, the so-called New Apostolic Reformation, or New Apostolic Reform, okay? And just let me caution anybody in the Bible study tonight, anybody watching, we're not a part of that mess. And I know we mentioned this a couple weeks ago, but I'm mentioning it again. We are not a part of that mess, and we're not going to be a part of that mess, because there's a lot of grievous and grotesque error to be found in that movement. And it's not the only movement. There have been a number of charismatic movements and, and outfits that have arisen in the last few decades that, that tend to focus the believer's attention over much on secondary things. Does that sound about right? Rather, am I making that clear enough? Now, to be clear, the spiritual gifts are important, and we'll get into that here as, as we continue through 1 Corinthians. The spiritual gifts are important, and we believe in every one of them. None of them have ceased in the church, okay? None of the offices have ceased. None of the gifts have ceased. None of them have been lost and in need of rediscovery. So tongues are still for us. Amen? Amen? They are. And they have a purpose. They're just, they just get misunderstood and misused a lot of times. Let me give you an example, okay? And many, you might have been to a church where they actually do this sort of thing. And I'm not necessarily condemning a church that does this as, as being heretical or something like that. I'm just saying that a lot of times they... They, just, they misunderstand it, and because they misunderstand it, they misapply it. So, you know, if every single time we assembled for a church service, whether it was a worship service, or whether it was a Bible study, or whatever, you always had, brother, let's just take Brother Matt, I'll use you because you're 
like right there, okay? And I know you're a good sport about it. Every time we had a church service, Brother Matt stood and had some prophecy in tongues every single time, like on cue. Like we would have our opening prayer and we'd sing a couple of songs and then we'd receive the offering and the tithe and now it's time for Brother Matt to stand and prophesy in tongues. Have at it, Brother Matt. And then Brother Matt would stand up. Bless you, sister. Come on in. You're just in time. 1 Corinthians chapter C, uh, 3. Chapter 3. I almost said 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And so he would stand up on cue and he would rattle off something that sounded like tongues, maybe. And we would all stand there and go, profound, amazing, yeah, great, <laughs> yeah, wow, hey, that's deep, and then nobody would interpret, and so all it was was an exercise of someone standing up and going, hey, tie a tie, eat a banana, and bless my spaghetti, amen, <laughs> you know, because it sounded like tongues, because he went to a class somewhere where they taught him how to speak in tongues, let me tell you something about tongues, and I know I'm jumping the text a little bit, but I think it's, a, it's critically important that a believer have a right understanding about this. Why? So that we don't get led astray into goofball, whacked out things that, however well-meaning, are still not right. So, all right, now that I've said that. Tongues are real. Tongues are right. It is a language. But it is not a language. It is not a natural language like you can go learn in a college somewhere. And any, any Bible college or seminary or whatever purporting to teach tongues as far as, okay, this is how you speak in tongues. Repeat after me. Blah, 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 whatever it is. Is, is a school or is a school of thought that has missed the mark on that. It is a heavenly language. It is given, not learned. It is granted, not taught. We can teach about it because it is a subject, right? We can teach you what's right and what's wrong, but as far as teaching someone how to speak in tongues, nothing happening there, nothing doing there. Nothing doing there. It is given. And now I've got some theories on this, but I don't really want to teach theories tonight. I want to teach scripture, okay? I want to teach what what is rock solid and is factual concerning this. It is a language that comes with the baptism of and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And so it's not something that, it's not something that the believer needs to stress about trying to learn. Now those of you that have either spoken in tongues or those of you who have, or those of you who have ever heard someone speak in tongues, have you ever noticed that no two people speaking in tongues sound alike? Yeah, I'll raise my hand on that because I've noticed that. I've been in churches where one brother speaking in tongues sounds like a typewriter. Another brother, you know, another brother speaking in tongues sounds like Arabic or Welsh or something like that, you know? And it's like, well, well what's, all, what's all that about? Why is it different? If it's a language, why does this person speaking in tongues sound different than this person speaking in tongues? Because honestly, it's ad hoc and it's given by the Holy Ghost. It's ad hoc. That, that, that's a Latin term, okay? It basically means it's a one-off. And I don't mean the gift is a one-off. I mean that it is the Spirit of God in you speaking, uttering in a language no man understandeth to the, speak, to the Spirit of God in God. Amen. Now, that's not prophecy in tongues. There's a difference between those two things, okay? Most times, tongues in a believer's life is just your private prayers between you and God. That's what the Bible refers to in the New Testament as praying in the Spirit or praying in the Holy Ghost. That's what builds up your most holy faith, the Apostle said. And so, Brother Matt praying in tongues, it's just, it's, that's him and God. And so, you're not going to understand that. And it's not for you to understand. When you're praying in tongues, Sister Brittany, and you, when you experience that and you pray in tongues, you, that's, that's you and God communing right there. That's the Spirit of God in you communing with the Spirit of God in God. And that, that's deep right there. You actually meditate on what that implies. It is profound. And I know we talked about it a little bit already in the first one or two chapters of this book. But when someone is moved by the Spirit of God in the Christian assembly to stand up 
and to prophesy in tongues. I'm so totally ahead of myself in the material, but, but we're going to ride this, okay? We're going to ride this and just cover this. When someone is moved by the Spirit of God to stand up and prophesy in tongues, then someone else or that same person in the church will also be moved upon by the same Holy Spirit, the same Holy Ghost, okay, to interpret those tongues. And Paul talks about that. And again, we'll get to that later on in the text. And maybe when we get that, we can just skip ahead because we're covering it right now, okay? But the else, it's just someone standing up and making a bunch of noise. It doesn't profit, it doesn't profit anyone. It doesn't edify anyone. And it doesn't mean anything. It's like... Brother John, you standing up and prophesying in Russian and then sitting back down. What are all the rest of us going to do? We're just going to look at each other and shrug and look back at Brother John and say, cool, all right, yeah, that was a cool story, bro. It's the church equivalent of that line, I guess, you know? And then we're all going to try to get back to what we were doing, you know? And that happens sometimes because somebody gets all zealous or amped up or wound up in themselves and well, I really want this to be a prophecy that I'm feeling, but it isn't. When the Holy Ghost actually moves upon a man or a woman to either prophesy or whatever, you will know it. There won't really be any doubt. So, well, is he just going to come in and take over? Is he going to come in and possess me? And I won't have any control? And I'll just leap up in the midst of it and shout out some kind of prophecy? And not all prophecies are in tongues. They're not. Not all prophecies are in tongues. Better to prophesy in a language that other people can actually understand. But sometimes it is in tongues, and there's a reason for that. There's someone that needs to see that. There's someone that needs to be assured of something. And, and tongues may be the only, the, only way that that, uh, the only way that that can be accomplished in their life. Does that make sense? I'm uh, chemically dependent tonight, if you're wondering. <laughs> so, caffeine, if there's any word. Well, I'm hoping that there's some trace amounts of it in there. It's decaf, but I do need it. I do need it. When the Spirit of God moves, up, and this, this goes for prophecy, this goes for the baptism of the Holy Ghost, this goes for anything at all. When the Spirit of God moves upon a man or a woman, you will know it. That person will know it. You won't be, oh, is this God or not? I'm not sure. If you're, if you're not sure, it probably isn't. It probably is not. It doesn't mean that it's a devil, okay? Let me be very clear about that, right? It, that's, it's not a, a dichotomy there, right? It's not binary. That's how people are putting it now. It just means that a lot of times it's a person's own zeal and just getting all wound up, and that's what a lot of the charismatics are all about. And so what you find is a church that takes the Holy Spirit seriously, and, the, church, and the, the terms Holy Spirit and Holy Ghost are interchangeable. They are the same person. They are the, they are the third person in the Godhead, okay? The Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. The Father, Son, Holy Spirit. doesn't matter which of those phrases that you use. Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, it's the same person. He is God. Don't you dare blaspheme. Amen? And you go back and, and read about that. That's the only sin that, uh, that's the only sin that is... is not forgivable. And of course, the moment you bring that up, the devil starts accusing. So, you know, if you've ever done that, you probably wouldn't be in this church anyway. Because you would have no interest. You would be a reprobate. But I'm, I'm rabbit trailing, so let's get this back on here. A church that takes the Holy Ghost seriously and takes the gifts of the Spirit seriously without focusing over much on them, because many groups do, you got to find that balance because, again, this is something I've seen demonstrated over and over and over again over many years is that you've got churches that completely neglect the gifts of the Spirit and the Spirit himself, and then you've got churches that are like, that's all they care about is the gifts of the Spirit. And they end up, they end up making a cult out of the Holy Ghost, and that is not what God intended, not, not at all. The Holy Ghost always directs us to Christ. Does that make sense? And so, and when Jesus, speaking back there, way back there in the Gospels, speaking to his disciples, I believe it was out on a boat at the moment, 
But speaking to his disciples, what did he say to Simon Peter when Simon Peter said, by the revelation of the Holy Ghost, Simon Peter said, thou art the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said that, that he was blessed because it wasn't flesh and blood that had revealed that to him, but it was the Holy Spirit. And then he said, upon this rock, I will build my church. We might have talked about this a few weeks ago, didn't we, in the Bible study? I think we did. It's coming up again. Jesus said he was going to build his church. He didn't say, I'm going to build the church of the Holy Ghost. You see kind of where we're going with this. It's the church of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. That is, he is the head of the church. It's his church. Now, I know sometimes it can get murky when people overthink it, as people are prone to do, because we're like, but I thought God the Father is God. Well, yes, he is, and Jesus Christ is his son, and he's also God. And then that, of course, turns into a question about the nature of the Trinity, which I'll shut down in an instant by saying, it's a mystery, and that's okay. He's a Trinity. How is that possible? Ask him. All right? But it's Jesus' church. It's Jesus' church. And we are God's children, yes, and his Holy Spirit his spirit, which is the Holy Spirit, that's how we differentiate him in our understanding from any other kind of spirit, okay, that is to dwell within us. And which a believer, when he first believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, receives a measure of that spirit until the time when he or she can be baptized completely and filled and surrounded with the Holy Spirit, which is an entirely separate work of grace. And I want to be very clear on that. Because there are always groups that will take that and mess that up too. Okay? Some people try to, to lump that into one singular experience. When a person gets saved, they're also filled with the Holy Ghost. You better be speaking with tongues or you're not even right with God. No. No. And biblical example doesn't support that either. It does not. Not at all. Go back. Again, go back to the book of Acts and read through that. And we haven't been in it in a while. Go back to the book of Acts and read. On every, read every occasion where you read about people receiving the Holy Ghost. These were people that were believers already. They already believed in Jesus. In one case, it was a group of people that they believed, but all they knew about was the baptism of John. And so there was some understanding that needed to be filled in there too. And we've asked this question before. I'll ask it again tonight. The people who were there in the upper room praying, on, or were there together in one accord, those believers that were there praying in one accord on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit first came. Well, I won't even ask you this question. I'll just make it as a statement. They were already believers. They were already saved. These were people that were already born again. Jesus had died. He had risen. He had returned to the Father. And so they were simply waiting for the fulfillment of that promise. Now that promise has been fulfilled. And so... You'll know when it's the Holy Ghost. Brother, you remember, don't you? You probably remember it pretty good, at least don't yeah, you? I do. I was there. That was awesome, wasn't it? Yes, it was. And it's proof. Proof sitting right there. Proof sitting right there. Proof standing right here. And I don't know about everyone else because I wasn't there perhaps when it happened. And maybe one or two or three folks here they have, they have not necessarily experienced that yet. Don't think for a second that you're not saved. If you have not experienced that baptism, not yet experienced that baptism, don't think that don't think for a second that it means that you're not a Christian. If you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, you've accepted his sacrifice for your sins, you are born again. Full stop. Accept it, settle it in your heart right now. Or the devil is just going to continue to use you as a as a a punching bag of doubt and make you unhappy and, and make you question. Not only your experience, but your relationship with God. But if you're a believer that has not yet experienced that baptism, you need to. And I don't mean you need to in order to get to heaven. I mean you need to so that you can live an empowered and a victorious Christian life. Why wouldn't a Christian want that? We ought to want everything we could possibly get from God. Amen? Amen. I did. Well, no, I take that back. I do now. 
I do now. I want everything I can get from God. But there was a time where I was still very skeptical. I was very skeptical of that, and thanks in large part to people that did not understand and that misunderstood and misrepresented what all of that was about. Tongues is not the be-all, end-all of the Spirit of God living in you. It's one of the benefits, but it's not the goal of it. Does that make sense? It's, it, and people that get that mixed up a lot of times, it, they end up they end up shortchanging their own experience in God. It's like, the, it's like permanent students who think that college is nothing but for the sake of college. Like, no, there's a goal behind that, right? Whether it's something shallow like getting a fancy piece of paper that says you have a degree, whoopie doo or whether it's a, a career that that's oriented towards so a person can pursue a certain line of work. Well, the, bapt the goal of the baptism of the Holy Spirit in you is so that the Holy Spirit can live in you and help you and empower you and manage you to a large degree. I don't like being managed. Somebody's going to manage you somewhere. And one thing he manages to do is teach you how to manage yourself to a large degree. Because with him living in you, this is turning into a class on pneumatology, the study of the Holy, the study of the Holy Ghost, okay? And it's not necessarily what we intended, but it's needful. It's needful. We don't have enough Bible studies. And so we've got to cover what we can as frequently as we can. It's needful for the Christian for the sake of your own spiritual quality of life. So the next question that would naturally arise out of that, or, or right on the heels of that, would be, well, then how do I receive the Holy Spirit? Does somebody give me the Holy Spirit? Do I have to pay money? No, I'm bringing that up for a reason. You know, there's a word for that. It's not in the Bible, but there's a word for that. It's an ancient word. It's been in the church for well over a thousand years. Simony. Simony is a sin. And it derives its name from a guy named Simon. No, not the apostle, okay? This was a different guy named Simon. You read about him in the book of Acts, who, when one or more of the apostles were present in a certain place and people were receiving this miraculous blessing, this gift, this indwelling of the Holy Ghost, this guy named Simon, who had previously been a sorcerer, right? That's a guy who meddles around in witchcraft, the occult. And I'll say more about that here in a moment. Um, he approached one of the apostles and said, hey, let me pay for that. I want to be able to lay my hands on people and, and give them the Holy Ghost too. And the apostle had the right answer. In fact, I think it was Simon Peter, wasn't it? I think it was Simon Peter that responded and said, your money perished with thee. You have no part in this because you have sought to purchase it with money. See kind of where we're going with this? There are groups and organizations that are out there that are committing this act by offering <coughs> classes for a fee. Classes on how to get the Holy Ghost or things that are related to that. Now, I got nothing against a school charging money to teach a class. That's there's nothing wrong with that in principle, but but when it when you view that as your as your your only hope or your only mode, it's just I haven't even had a chance to give this uh, enough thought to really articulate it very well. But there's something very very wrong there. So, well, how do I get the Holy Ghost? The Holy Ghost? Do I, do I, do I take a class? No. Uh, do I have to pray a certain prayer? No. Well, well, what do I do? Well, first of all, be open to Him. Really. First of all, be open to Him. And I say that first of all because you know one of the first one of the biggest obstacles to people receiving the Holy Ghost is that they disbelieve. They disbelieve that that's for them. They disbelieve that it's for anybody today. They disbelieve that for whatever different. There's a number of different reasons that they have for not believing that it's an actual thing or that it's for them. Uh, and excuse me. Be open to Him, and you'll be surprised. And pray. Seek him. Actively, actively seek him. And so do I have to do it in church? No, you can. 
You can do it in church. Brother Matt received the Holy Ghost, I think, on a Thursday night service or something like that. Sunday night, maybe. It was uh, some kind of an evening service, I remember. Reverend, uh, Reverend DeRider was there. We were both praying with you. And, and boom, there it was. And, 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 it was, and it was awesome. I received the Holy Ghost driving a car. I've told, I've told that story many times. And Lord willing, I'll tell it many times more. I'll wear it out. Because it's an amazing account of, uh, of, of how God can just very well do whatever we're open to allowing him to do. But notice that it's scriptural. Whatever God does by the Holy Ghost, he does, he, or rather he never does it contrary to scripture. So God can fill with the Holy Ghost in a church service. He can fill with the Holy Ghost in a prayer meeting. He can fill somebody with the Holy Ghost tonight in Bible study. If your heart's open to it, and if so be he move upon you and, and seek to enter and dwell. So that sounds scary. There's nothing scary about it. I can tell you from experience. Nothing scary about it. And I, and I, I don't want to go into, in, into that detailed account again, because we really are supposed to be teaching Bible, and I'm already at a half hour, but I'm going to pretend I didn't look. <laughs> okay. I've heard of people being filled with the Holy Ghost in their barracks rooms, in the military, people being while driving a car, uh, at, at home, in the privacy of their own home. My late pastor told the story uh, of uh, how and when. And he had been, he had been a preacher for years before that experience had even come to him. Because he had always been in the denomination he had been a part of. He had always been taught that that just really wasn't for us today. That that was something that had concluded with the apostles or some time way long ago. But sitting at home alone uh, one evening, as he told the uh, account, and forgive me if I don't get all of the details it's exactly right. It's coming from memory, okay, secondhand. But he wanted something more. He wanted something deeper than just salvation. And he didn't know exactly what even he was searching for. He just knew that he wanted something closer, something deeper, something more profound. And right there, and he had to do it quiet too because I think his wife was sleeping and he didn't want to wake her up. And it, I say it meaning the experience. I say he meaning the Holy Spirit came upon him and came within him. And he didn't really even understand exactly what it was until he did understand. And he was filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, that's his story. I can tell mine. I guess I am going to talk about it. I wasn't planning on teaching about this. See, some of you have already heard this. Some of you have not. I was a skeptic. I was a skeptic until the moment God arrived. I was driving home. After an evening service or Bible study at, at uh, the church I attended in Tillicum, Washington, I, I was driving an eight, uh, a Maroon 1984 Honda Accord. Totally irrelevant, but this is the details that get burned into your brain, you know? And I had just turned left onto the entrance ramp of I-5, Interstate 5, to go north towards McCord Air Force Base to head back to the barracks. And somewhere along that entrance ramp, he showed up. And he showed up, and, and you have to rely somewhat on metaphor to explain something like this because it is a spiritual thing, it is spiritually given, it is spiritually discerned, etc. Okay, it's all those disclaimers there. He arrived. No one else was in the car with me. I was driving home alone, and then I wasn't alone because he was there, and he was at the door of my heart, you could say, very really at my heart. And he did not force his way in. And this is, this, is another, this is another thing that's crucial to understand. The Holy Spirit is a perfect gentleman. He does not force himself upon or within anyone. He does not do that. And I guarantee you, anybody in that upper room, anybody that was there on the day of Pentecost, that when he first was given to the church, anyone in that prayer meeting that was not receptive, he didn't force his way in. He didn't. He didn't force himself upon me either. But the instant that I recognized him for who he was, which was almost instantly, by the way, 
I threw open the door to my heart that evening because I noticed that this was the best friend I never even knew that I had. Yeah, go ahead and preach on this guy. I'm supposed to be talking about the wise master builder. Next week, I guess. And when I let him in, it was like all of the sunshine of summer coming into a house that had always been dark and had never seen that kind of light. Does that make sense? I mean, picture your own living room with the curtains and the blinds always closed. Sure, there's some light that leaks through all of that, but it's not a whole lot, right? And then picture every time you open those blinds and open your front door. Our house faces north, so we don't get a lot of direct room. Direct, we don't get any direct light in the, in our front room of our house, which also has the biggest window in the house. Okay, um, so it's pretty dim in that room. And so sometimes what I'll do just to get some light in there is I'll open the blinds and I'll open the front door just to get some daylight in there, so I don't have to use a lamp in the middle of the day. It's like that. When the Holy Ghost comes in, he comes in to live, and he brings that light and that joy and that power. And there is power. What? And that, that, there's a whole other teaching that's, that's adjacent to that, okay? But I, but I don't want to distract myself any more than I already have, okay? But he comes in and he brings that power and he brings discernment with him and he brings comfort with him. He brings that, and the experience, and it, it, the experience itself might vary a little bit between people, okay? And that's one reason why it's even a little bit risky talking about it, in the, it, it, it to the degree that I'm talking about it right now, because I don't want to set up an expectation in someone, and then it ends up being different. You, you understand what I mean? And then there's doubt or something like that. But there's a uniformity that's there between all of them. When he comes, he brings power. He brings joy. He brings comfort. And there's discernment that comes with that, too. He brings discernment. He really does. And discernment is just, it, it refers to judgment and understanding between right and wrong and, 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 and so on. And when that happens, a lot of your problems, not all, but a lot of your problems will begin to solve themselves particularly problems with certain sins that have overtaken you in times past, you will find that you have a much greater strength within you by the Spirit of God. You have a much greater strength within you to resist or even to completely overcome and crucify those things. And then there are other gifts that he actually brings with him at times. And it's not like superpowers. We've talked about that before. You know, when someone says, well, I have the gift of prophecy, and then and, and, and they might, but a lot of times they think that that's like, I have the gift of flight, or I have the gift of shooting lasers out of my eyes. That's not how the spiritual gifts work. It's not, he doesn't give you a superpower for you to use at will or abuse at will. The gifts are always given at the time, on the spot, as the need, and as the faith all arise. That's why when so, you meet someone who says, I have the gift of healing. Immediately swallow that with a spoonful of salt. Try not to choke. Okay? Because, no, they don't. God has the gift of healing, and he gives it to heal. He doesn't give it to make somebody superpowered, or else, why don't people like that go clean out all the hospitals? Really? Really, it's time to debunk some of that nonsense, because there are a lot of people that are out there that give the wrong impression, teach the wrong thing, and they end up causing damage to people's faith and cause damage to people's lives. We don't want to do that. So, now, all of that stemming from talking about being filled with the Holy Ghost. And all of that stemming from us being a part of the overall operation of God reaching out to the souls of the lost. We were talking about, and we've got to wrap, we've got to wrap it up here in just a moment. He said, for we are laborers together with God. We are God's husbandry Ye are God's building. And I don't think there's a way to tie all of that into what we were just talking about here. So we're actually next week, we're going to pick it up at verse 9 and verse 10. But for tonight, okay, and it's been a teaching, it has been a teaching, but it's, it's 
very necessary because time is short and we don't have time to get led into the wrong thing. So as believers, you and I, all of us here together tonight in this Bible study, let's not let ourselves fall into either ditch of error, either extreme, when it comes to the Holy Ghost and the gifts of the Spirit. Let us not shove them all off and, and say they're not for us today and, and, and go into that extreme. Let's not do that. Let's not just become theologians who are well studied but have no power and no fire. We don't want to do that. There's enough churches in the world that are like that today. We can't be like that. But let us not commit the opposite error of running altogether over into the sensationalism and the charismaticism and the showmanship and frankly the charlatanry that you find in a lot of operations that hyper-focus on these things either. Let's not go to either extreme. We have both for a reason. We have the Word. We have the Spirit. We need them both. To be balanced Christians, we need them both. So let us continue to learn in the Word. Let us continue to be biblically literate Christians. We must be. We can't afford not to be. Because where you have biblically illiterate Christians, you have sucker bait for cults to come by and sweep them up. Let us continue to be biblically literate, ever learning, but having already come to the knowledge of the truth. Let's put it that way. Let us always be learning the Word of God, but at the same time, let us be willing to be led by the Holy Spirit. Because we must never forget the Bible says, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they shall be called the sons of God. He didn't say as many as have doctorates in theology. Can we get an amen on that one? No, it's not church service, but still, you know? Knowledge is important, and I've stressed that a lot over the last few years. Knowledge is important. The Bible tells us that we ought to grow in the grace and the knowledge of God. But notice that he puts that word grace in there too. You know, it's not all just a one-sided thing. So be open to the Holy Spirit. If you've not experienced that baptism, don't feel bad. Just seek it. Seek the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Pray for that. Tonight, I dare you, you might be surprised. He may answer you and fill you on the spot. And when he does, you will speak in tongues. And it's not you who has to try to conjure it up. It's another mental roadblock that happens to a lot of people when they, when, they're, when they want to see this realized in their lives. He will come, and he will speak through you. And it might sound ludicrous in your ears. It doesn't matter. It's him talking. Let him. Okay? It is the initial evidence of his indwelling. And, and, you, and then you go from there. And then you go from there. So be open to the Holy Spirit's indwelling. Be open to the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And you'll find when you do, and when he does, you'll wonder why it didn't happen sooner. <laughs> and, you'll wonder, and you'll wish it had. You really will. That's probably a good place to park it for tonight. Goodness, almost 45 minutes. Let's stop right there, and we'll dismiss in prayer. Brother Matt, would you please dismiss us in prayer? Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift that you've given us through Son Jesus Christ and the word that he has also given us to live by. And we also give thanks for the lessons that you have uh, given through the pastor to us to use as we go about our day to meditate on your word and the Holy Ghost. And may we please use what we are given for the gospel to meal in our lives and our daily lives, Lord. And we ask this humbly in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, God bless you all. Now, a quick announcement. I'll be probably announcing this um, tonight and again Thursday night and again Sunday morning. Come back, okay? Um, it's safe. It's clear. Oh, yeah, that's right. We're still live, aren't we? Not anymore. Don't turn it off. <laughs>